desk, where people are moving. And of course, we can plot out where we want lights to be. Right? How we can run cables. Usually cables might run like front to back because we have to run to a console, sort of usually in the back of the room, right? A dimmer board. Right? Everybody know what like a lighting console would sort of look like? It'd be like a, almost like an audio board, right? But of course we have faders that control the lights on them. And we can bring, call up individual lights. You know, if this was light number 16, we'd call up 16, bring it down to 50%, bring it up to 83% and stuff like that. Be able to control our lighting. And again, this was all in that guide that I sent you guys. And this is in Blackboard also. That's our studio production handbook right there. Okay. <clears throat> so now, everybody familiar? Have you heard the term? Well, let's kill this. Oops, we're not ending the meeting. I just want to close that out. Okay. Not sharing. What types of lights usually, has anybody heard names of certain lights, things? Yeah. What are different types of lights? HMI. Okay, what's HMI, you know? I don't uh, have to look up the meaning of it, but. Halogen, I forgot, halogen, okay. mercurial, okay. something. Yeah, okay, right? But they're more like a daytime light. You know, they give you a certain. Yeah, they give like, you 56 degree Kelvin degrees. What's that? 5,600 Kelvin degrees. Okay, there you go. All right. All right. Now, what does that mean? You brought up a good point. Uh, that's uh, basically the color temperature of sunlight. <clears throat> there you go. Exactly. Okay. 5,600 to like 6,000 K. All right. Uh, color temperature is something that we talk a lot about. Okay. When we talk about video, television, studio production, what does color temperature really mean? How would we describe color temperature? Anyone else? Uh, it's, it's basically a sunny day. <laughs> okay, but if we're in a studio though, yeah. there are no windows. So how would sun or light come into play there? You know, what, well, you, can, yeah. you can hit the windowsill with a 5600 uh, with an HMI 56K light, mm -hmm. and you would get the effect of sunshine. Coming back through a window? window? But again, let's say we're in, okay. Um, <clears throat> but what about standard studio lighting? Does that have like, is it going to be, as bright as daylight? No, it's not. Uh huh. Right. Why not? Why not? <clears throat> because there are different types of fixtures okay, that we could use. One of the most common type of a fixture is called a Fresnel. Fresnel. Okay. Right. Okay. As you spell it, it's really like a French term. Yep. F R E S N E L. F R E S N E L. A Fresnel. It's usually a, a spotlight, okay? Adjustable beam, okay? Which is used in a studio, a Fresnel light. You can hang them off a grid, right? Control them by a board. <clears throat> now, what type of bulbs are mostly found in like studios? Incandescent light. Incandescent? What does incandescent mean? And, and what's another term also, what's, sort of interchangeable with incandescent or I'm looking for, what, what is the filament? Anybody hear the term? What's yeah. used inside uh, an incandescent light? Begins with a T. <clears throat> tungsten. Tungsten, very good. Tungsten, okay. So how does tungsten work in a light bulb? You apply Electrical charge to it, power, okay? Click it on, what happens to that? Tungsten is a filament, right? Heats up. Gets really hot and it glows, okay? Normally, what color does it glow? White. White. 
white balance. No, no, no. But you're you're hitting some good terms, but typically tungsten would glow more orange. It would glow much more orange. As we start getting toward the white and getting brighter, of course, then we're going higher in color temperature. Okay? But in the studio, most of our studio tungsten lighting, and uh, Edward, you raised a good point, it's like 5,600K for like daylight to 6,000 or even higher on the Kelvin scale. That's what the K stands for. But a lot lower than that, about almost half of that, like 3,200K, right, is the color temperature for like tungsten. Okay? And bulbs that sort of glow warm and orange. When we talk about color temperature, a good example, sometimes if you're walking down the street, you ever see some lights on the outside of a building that sort of glow orange, or, you know, lights inside people's living rooms, indoors in the house, any okay, apartments, they glow orange, right? Or maybe the outside glows more blue or whiter. Then you can really clearly see the difference in color temperature, okay? And it is measured in terms of on the Kelvin scale, the K scale, right? 3,200 degrees all the way up towards 6,000 and so. Um, <clears throat> now, as we get higher in that Kelvin scale, does that mean physically that the light gets hotter or just the appearance of it, the appearance of daylight, okay? Now, if we create an atmosphere, you go into a restaurant, a bar, a club, someplace, tungsten and incandescent lighting is usually used there to create the atmosphere. Okay? A nice warm look to the room. Correct? Very often also, you know, if we would if we were shooting like in an office building, we're shooting in an office. You bring in your light kit, you've got your incandescent lights, and you set up your stands and everything. What happens if there are windows on the side, right? There is sort of a balancing act that goes on between color temperatures, color temperatures. Because inside you're gonna have one color temperature and the light coming from the outside and outside that window is gonna be a totally different color temperature, okay? Which could affect the subject that you're shooting and the room and everything. So how could we help balance, let's say color temperatures? Let's go back to, you know, the studio settings in the old days and <clears throat> things that, you know, tools that are available to us. Is there anything we can do in that office to help balance out color temperatures between internal interior and outside lights? What could we do? Well, yeah, if you wanted to soften the, uh outside lights you could gel the windows there you go a gel key terms okay gels are popular terms for lighting what does a gel do mostly it softens light <clears throat> uh it can that's one function of it there are gels that just are diffuse okay by softening another word for softening is diffusion right softening lighting, helping to diffuse the light. But what else? What else can gels do? Change give the color. A, change what? Color. Color. Color gels. Absolutely. You can get the whole spectrum of gels in color. Orange, red, blue, green. Okay. Now, what can we do? I mean, sometimes, you know, in the studio setting, you might have a curtain or a back wall or flats, right? And we want to put, you know, a nice purple streak in the back. You can use a gel and light for that, okay? What do barn doors do? What are barn doors? Uh, they're like uh, <clears throat> flaps on the sides, usually of a fresnel, right? uh, and uh, you can direct light Use exactly. the direct light or cut it off. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. It's one tool that we can use on the front of a lighting fixture to limit the scope of our light. 
limit that beam. We can create nice, nice little sliver on the back wall. We can help <clears throat> spot it on a plant or a picture on the wall and helps us really shape the light, the light that we're putting on to a set or a subject. Okay. Um, Barn door is right. Our rotatable features of a lighting fixture, usually four sides to them. You can bring in the sides, bring in the top and bottom and really cut that light to where you want. You can make a nice little sliver, put it on the back wall and that would create, you know, sort of a nice streak on the back wall if you wanted to do something like that. Okay. Um, again, we talk about color temperature, diffusion. Now, what does diffusion do? When you take a Fresnel, okay, uh, a light, it usually does have a little adjustment to it. What do the adjustments let us do? <clears throat> barn doors. No, not the barn doors. Now, let's, there's what? usually on the side of a Fresnel, there might be a knob or a little lever that might move the bulb within the fixture forward or back. So what does that help us do a little? It changes the color temperature of the subject. No, 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 not the color temperature now. We're talking about a fixture itself. Okay, think about this. When you go, you see those triangular bulbs, you go to like Home Depot or hardware store or something. Um, a couple of the characteristics that you're looking for, I'm looking for two specific terms. One is wide and one is narrow. What are other ways to say wide or narrow in lighting? What's a narrow beam of light? Shotgun. Spotlight. Spotlight, yeah. What spot? What's a wider beam of light? Wide angle. What's a, what's a wider beam of light? Two important terms here. Spot or what else you get? What's the other setting? How about flood? Floodlight? Anybody ever hear floodlight? Tim? Yeah. Floodlight. Okay. So what does a spotlight do? Oh, you've been to enough concerts and things. What does a spotlight do? It focuses light on a single subject or a single point. Okay. It's usually a direct beam of light, usually with definable edges to it. Okay. Usually sort of with definable edges to it. All right. Um, when we look at, let me just see here, color temperature, how's the best way to describe it also? <clears throat> directional. Ah, it's directional. Okay. Usually has edges to it. Now, how can we see edges? Very often in theatrical productions, the stage, music, dramatic productions, things. <laughs> What's a cool effect that they use on the stage to really enhance the lighting effects? And how would it be different, let's say, from a newscast or so? Think about this. When you go see a concert or something, what do they usually do before the acts come on, with the band or something? You ever see like fog machine? You know, yeah. A little theatrical smoke? Yeah. Okay. They put the mist in the air, create a haze. What does that do? What does that bring out? Tension? Uh, could be. But what does it let us really see? What does it let us see? Why do they do that? Why do they do that? Why would you use like for a dramatic production or a concert or something, a fog machine? Filling the stage with mist. Doesn't that enhance the lighting, the lighting effects? Yeah. You think? Yeah. And when you watch a newscast, or something, 
Can you actually see the beams of light? No. No. I mean, we got people sitting around the round table. You know, you got the meteorologist standing there. You got other people giving their reports. They don't care about that. Here, watch this. Let's see. Uh, let me go to someone's website here. Okay. <clears throat> Who's uh? Share is how many people are hearing somebody's uh audio. You can mute your audio, guys. Okay, let me just put this up here one second. Let me do um theater or music. Uh huh. Okay. Let's do television. Second. There we go. And again, I'll share my screen with you guys when these things come up. Ah, here we go. Here's a perfect example of what we do. Let me share my screen. Aha. Uh -huh. So when Dave comes on, take a look at this image. See the mist? See the fog? Yeah. Okay. See what it brings out? We can actually see the exact beams of light. Mm -hmm. Okay. Look at that. Creating a mood, creating a feel. Anything like that. Okay. Now, if we were in the studio, you know, shooting a newscast or a PSA, we probably wouldn't be going for effects like this, right? Right. But this is for, you know, the visual effect for the audience, right? It enhances the whole atmosphere and the whole viewing experience for everybody, right? See that? It's different types of lighting in there. So these are very directional sort of spotlights that can be on there, right? <clears throat> and now these can be moving, it can be stationary, it can change color, everything, right? Now when we talk about like white balance, okay, in video, and I'm going to talk to Dave, you know, about some of the advances in the technology and things like this, how things have changed and things that we can control, um, you know, in lighting when we do it. What's the purpose, you know, because I think, you know, a live performance is much different than, let's say, a studio performance, a studio event, let's say, you know, a production that we're doing, a public service announcement or a newscast or something like that. I mean, this would not be appropriate for, you know, two guys sitting at an anchor desk, you know, or doing like Meet the Press or something, right? We don't need all the foo-foo there, you know, not, we don't need the wow factor here. All right. Take this back. Yeah. Let's go back to uh, television and music. Let's go back to television. All right. Let's go back to news. Take a look. Last thing. Here we go. Let's open this page for us. Aha. Here we go. Okay. Look at the difference in the background elements and things that we have to light. Okay, there we go. See different types of elements that we use. Well, and, you know, you guys can get different ideas, you know, for how you'd go about, let's say, shooting a newscast or your PSA, right? Mm -hmm. Again, we're doing it all virtually. So in a way, like the sky's the limit, right? We don't actually, we're not gonna get the chance, I don't think, to really carry it out in the studio. So if you say, you know, I wanted free panels, with magenta lighting and curved track lights at the top and a, an illuminated stage or riser here. All right, you know, you can use your imagination and, you know, put in there whatever you want, right? To create sort of the drama, the effect or the intensity of, uh, you know, to get the message across that you want to convey, right? So that's really important there. Let me kill this, okay? Um, other terms here that we use, we talked about transfusers, translucent material often to use a soft and reduce the intensity of light. 
diffusion, okay? Brightness and intensity we talk about. What does diffusion mean? When we want to diffuse light, is that a spotlight? Is it a floodlight? What do you think? Diffusion. Think about this. You have sort of a spotlight. Now, what are a couple of ways we could diffuse this? One is we could use either a diffusion gel in front of the lens, okay? And what does diffusion mean? What does it do? Scatters the light. What's that? Scatters light. Scatters it. Okay. Yeah. Helps spread it out. What's a great natural diffusion, even outside? What's, a, fog. what's, a, what's that? Clouds. Fog. Yeah. yeah. Clouds. Clouds usually, you know, they diffuse a light. Okay. Sometimes, you know, when you got a cloud cover up there, you can almost look directly at the sun because it's being so diffused. Right? On a bright sunny day, you know, I wouldn't suggest doing this, please don't. Okay, you don't want to be staring at the sun or taking a look up there because you're going to damage your eyes. But you know, if it's an overcast sort of day, you know, you can look up there, you're still seeing the brightness, but it's not that one pinpoint of light, which is going to really hurt your eyes. Okay, it really takes that intensity way down and spreads it out over a large area for us. Okay. Now, when we talk about white balance, what is white balance? What do we do? When we do like theatrical productions, do we have to white balance anything? Yeah, the camera. Well, but not really, you look, when we do a theatrical production, okay, uh, let's say there are no cameras, you're just in the audience, all right? You're seeing the true colors of everything, right? Your eyes, hopefully. Okay. You're seeing the colors on the walls, seeing the colors in the foreground, you know, any set pieces, any props, clothing that people are wearing. So how do we reproduce this true color? The true color, right? For television, for television. How do we reproduce that? We have to the let the camera color. know what white looks like. Right, okay. When we white balance something, we're defining for the camera what true white looks like at a given color temperature. At a given color temperature. Because color temperatures are always gonna be changing, right? Whether we go indoors, outdoors, into a store, okay? Um, public transportation, anything. You go down to the subway, the color temperatures are constantly changing. And our eyes are now adjusting for this, right? Defining what's white, what pure white is. And you see, when we do this for the camera, for the television camera, we have two types of balancing that we do. We do a white balance and a black balance, okay? Mm. In order white balance, defines for the camera exactly what true white is in, in this certain color temperature, in this for a certain environment that we're at, okay? Black balance does the same thing, but for black, okay? It defines what true black is, all right? Now, remember our, our color bars that we have and the way we break up color in a television signal, remember color bars, that's our test signal, if we take away the color, we're left with a grayscale, okay? If we can identify what true white is and what true black is, the camera then fills in everything else on our grayscale and lets us determine exactly what the proper color is gonna be, okay, that we need to be seeing, where, according to our red, green, blue scale, everything like that, okay? Let me just show something as far as color temperature. Here, let's kill this. Let me show you another example. Yeah. <clears throat> um, all right. Ah, here's a good one. I'll bring this up with Dave too. Okay. Look at this. Want to see the difference between warm and cool? Look at this shot on the left. See what warm white is? See what cool white is? Right? 
it's got a very different feel to it. I don't know. I mean, uh, okay, but but yeah, but the color temperature. This is all about color temperature right here. <clears throat> Uh, but it doesn't have to, why the editor? Why the editor? I mean, these could be sets. You see that if we're lighting something like this in the studio, we can either make this nice and warm or we can use those daytime gels. Now, doesn't this sort of relate? Here, I'm going to back this novel in here. Okay. This could, you know, be like more of an evening set, right? Could this be more of a daytime set? Definitely. All right. See, but yeah, you're right. As far as the blueness and the coolness of the color temperature that's in here. All right. Understand? See the way everything is? Now, if we were white balancing on here, maybe the sulfur is really white. Okay. And we want to we want to define for our camera that this is where our white balance is. If we were using maybe gels, other things or incandescent tungsten lighting, we can create the effect of a much warmer white in here. White versus cool, warm versus cool. It's very distinct in the contrast that's right here. See that? Same room, two very different feels to it. More of like an early evening or late time, you know, and then, and then something more like a daytime. Hi, Mr. Lewis, how are you? Good. Did you get something? It's time to get the nails. Watch your mute. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Let's talk about shadows and lighting and things that we do. How can we use, you know, very often when we look at um, a scene, okay, our shadows are good, are they bad? What, what do you think? overall <clears throat> because I've known in production especially like in corporate productions they hate shadows they mm -hmm. absolutely they try to eliminate shadows at all cost they want them off the walls they want, you know so we can use lighting to eliminate shadows and use lighting to create shadows right what can shadows do you know even you know looking at a scene for us and also, how would you describe contrast in a scene? Which of these scenes has more contrast to it? <clears throat> That's one of the things that shadows do is they produce a lot of contrast. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it can also produce mystery by obscuring your subject. Yeah, yeah. Okay, they can obscure the subject. They can bring things out. Um, yeah. Well, they can highlight a subject. <laughs> well, they can highlight, absolutely. Let's take a look over here. <clears throat> look at that. Shadows, right? Drama, tension, su suspense, right? Casting shadows on the wall, right? Usually with a high intensity key light, and we're gonna talk more about the terms of like basic lighting that we do, okay? A high intensity key light would create sharp shadows on the wall, very intentional. What about something like this? Mm. Look at that, okay? Everybody know uh, Orson Welles? Heard of him? Who is he? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what happened? Was he wearing a mic or so? Okay, well, I could tell you a good story about something like that with someone, all right? Um, I used to work years ago. For an we did corporate communications for an insurance company called Mutual of New York, Money, M-O-N-Y. And 
in the corporate world, especially people who do sales and they sell life insurance, things like that, they think of themselves as sort of like heroes for helping protect the family, okay? And they came up with a poem, or a poem was they found, was, and it was called Heroes. And they paid this guy a lot of money to read the poem on camera for one of their big sales meetings. You know, they have annual sales meetings. They bring all their top producers in, you know, they wine and dine them, right? You know, these people, are, they, they make sometimes millions in commission, right? Real high earners for the company, right? So they wanted Orson Welles to read this poem on camera. They give him the thing, he reads it, and now there were a bunch of corporate people in the room, right? And you want to talk about like a diva prima donna? One of the corporate people who is part of the media department said, Orson, that was great, but could you do it with a little more emphasis on this or that? He didn't like the direction he was given. So immediately he said, he didn't want to do it. He thought basically I'd do one and done. I'll read this thing. I don't have to stay here. I'm gone, right? They pay him a lot of money. So he was ready. He read it once. He was ready to leave. Corporate person asked him to do it again. He was pissed. He takes a sheet of paper, says, okay, and he reads it <laughs> like this. He says, I'll give you a second take, but I'm not going to do it on camera for you. He literally put the piece of paper in front of his face, and that was it. So, yeah, but it's the same thing also. You know, sometimes you do get talent, especially there was a famous story with Joe DiMaggio also. He was doing a commercial for something. He was holding his bat. Okay. And after a take or two, the director comes to him and says, Joe, that was good, but could you hold the bat differently? Hold the bat a different way? Joe gets really pissed. He storms off. And, of course, he's wearing his microphone, goes outside, and he goes, and then he's yelling and cursing at the director, and they could hear this, you know. He's telling me, the Yankee Clipper, how to hold my bat. <laughs> he wasn't too pleased with that, right? But, yeah, sometimes you get people who really really don't want to well at least they don't want to be bothered with certain inconveniences let's say or be directed by it um i worked with james earl jones doing something for the national education association <clears throat> um, and again he was reading something for them problem was that we, even though we had a director there james earl jones liked to direct himself and even in the middle of a great take or something, he would just say, cut, no, I don't like it. I'm going to start again and do it. And he turned into just, I'm sorry, he was a real pain in the, pain in the ass to work with. But, I mean, he was a great talent. But, you know, it's like, okay, let's get through this already and do it. <coughs> but, yeah, I could see how someone like this could be sort of a problem. All right. Now, let's look also about shadows and things that we can use, some of the tools that we can use, okay? okay? Lights through slats. Very often they can use these just to create patterns on the wall. But of course, it's giving us a dr very dramatic look as to, <clears throat> you know, what our subject is, okay? What we see, the facial features, and how it really pops out here, okay? Let's take another one. There was another one with shadows. Here we go. <clears throat> okay. The figure in the back of the theater, you know, we've got this, the projector light coming out at us. All right. Now, of course, some of the best contrast we get, of course, is in like black and white features. All right. Old time black and white features giving us very high contrast. Okay. <clears throat> so this is a good example. All these are you, you know, using shadows and key lights. Now, when we talk about basic lighting, what type of lighting do we talk about? It's like three-point lighting. What are the three points that we usually talk about? Uh, your key, your fill, and your backlight. Okay. Key, your fill, and a backlight. Okay. What does a backlight do? What's a backlight? Separates the uh, subject from the background. Okay. Right, it helps give us some separation. A backlight usually comes from high above, over the shoulder or so, gives us a nice little edge. And right, it does give us that separation 
between the subject and the background. Okay. Um, a key light. What does a key light do? It's a main uh, light that, that uh, lights the subject. Uh -huh. Okay, there's a good example of like a key light. Okay, a key light in there. Okay. Very often, a key light is what gives us a primary you know, source there. And what does a fill light do, ultimately? Does eliminate it shadows. Helps to eliminate shadows and fill in other details, okay, on a subject. Okay. Um, you know, so basic three-point lighting that we'd have, something like right here, okay? So, again, more terms that we would use to describe. <clears throat> Color temperatures, we know what those are. And remember, we talked about sunlight, studio tungsten, have different, what was the key? Color temperatures will affect the color quality of a shot. Okay, so absolutely. That's exactly what we're talking about right here. Here's a perfect example of that, okay? Color temperatures, okay? Right there. When we talk about, okay, Two main objectives. We'll talk to Dave about some of this stuff too. Diffusers and intensity. Let's talk about a backlight. Just what Edward just said. Separate the subject from the background. All right. Um, things that we look at in the viewfinder and what we want to see. Zebra patterns help us to do things. Main source of lighting. Three-point lighting is called the key light. Okay, which is that main light. Three-point lighting, diffusion, wide area, soften shadows, diffuse light, color temperature again, contrast, especially the level of black and the level of white. How deep are our black levels? How deep and rich are the blacks and how bright are the bright levels, okay? Talk about spotlights, spotlight, directional lighting, in something like this, not a lot of directional lighting. It's a lot of flood lighting, you know, and things that just fill in the, the main room, okay? It might change, of course, you know, if we have subjects in here and we want to see, you know, individual people, you know, and, and what the interaction is going to be, what, it, what it's going to be. This is definitely more like a soap opera setting. This could be like a, you know, daytime sort of sitcom, you know, much different feel for it. Barn doors and lighting plot. Here's the term Fresnel that we used, okay? Which is that spotlight right there, all right? So I also wanna talk about, you know, when Dave gets here and we're gonna talk like at three o'clock about, remember we talk about things like using depth of field and with our technology, with video, we have irises, you know, an iris that regulates out the amount of light that comes in and hits those sensors, correct? The amount of light that comes in and hits the sensors there, right? Very important, very important, right? And also in the ability to control our depth of field that we have, right? So, any questions so far on lighting? We're gonna show some more examples too. So you say any irises the light that comes in and hits the ISO? Not the ISO, it's our, it's our sensor, right? In the back of the camera, it's the electronic sensor. The light comes in, hits the sensor, and that creates, make, it's converted into our image, okay? Now remember, <clears throat> when we talk about depth of field and iris, the bigger the number, the smaller the opening, okay? But the bigger the number, the greater the depth of field. This is still great. As you can see, the depth of field is going smaller and smaller and smaller till we're down to just our subject right here. Smaller f-stop number, very shallow depth of field and everything else is sort of blurred out. To what extent, all right? That's up to our own, our own individual taste and for the piece that we're doing, okay? So that's exactly what we want to do. Let me stop sharing here one second. Okay, we're back here. 
Let me just show here. Aha. <clears throat> Dave will be with us in a second. <clears throat> Any questions? <clears throat> like I said, I want you to get, look, in the next few days, get those pitch sheets done, please. All right? You got to have them done and in. Work on your scripts. Work on your thoughts for your PSAs, your public service announcements, and what you want to do. Okay. Um, some people have asked me, okay, I will send out the pitch sheets again. Get those into me. Get your homework assignments into me so they can be graded. Uh oh, right. oh and yeah. also the scripts. Uh, you can send me another copy of the, another copy of the scripts. I'm looking for it right now to see it. In the file. They don't send you a script. No, you come over, you write the script. No, like you send me the examples, of, um, the, the, um, the thing, and I write the paper that I have to fill out the script. Um, the sheet. And what, then I did, what, for marking the script? Yeah. No, you're going to be marking your own script. You got to write your script, right? No, I don't like it's a sheet, like, um, that's so how I could do my own script. Uh, you need a pitch sheet. Oh, well, there's a pitch sheet. Yeah. Okay. But that, well, tells, that tells, you know, all the technical and creative requirements you're going to want for the PSA. And like I said, because we're doing this virtually, you know, you can just run with it. Right? So if you want to imagine a camera, you know, swooping in from left to right, you know, you can put that in as one of your shots. It's how we open or how we close or whatever. Um, if you want, you know, people sitting at a desk or round table, you want to throw in, you know, B-roll, any other stuff that we have, you know, or uh, resources. So basically it's taking what you've learned, taking what you know, and being able to incorporate it into a production. Being able to incorporate it into a production, right? For 60 seconds. <clears throat> You write your own script, just as a regular document, okay? I've sent you, you know, my sample of what, you know, I did, remember the census one? My census script, I don't know if I'll have time to show you. Let's see, there's my marked up script, remember? <clears throat> Let's see my census script here. PSA script. Do I have that marked up for myself? <clears throat> right, remember? This was the PSA script that I did, and I marked it, you know, with what cameras are going to be. Right? And I had the guy walk in. I did the whole thing. Let me stop sharing one sec here. Where is my, I want to look at. <clears throat> Hang on, let me just find what we did. Since this PSA elements, here we are. Let me open this one. <clears throat> Okay, yeah, I'll share my screen again. Okay, remember the pitch sheet? Here was the pitch sheet I showed you guys. Title was the 2020 census. Tagline, why participating in the 2020 census is so important for our communities and our state. I went through all this stuff. Cameras, three, script, yes. Length, 60 seconds. Lower third graphics. Talent needed, one on camera. Not you said there's blank versions of this? Yes. You have a blank pitch sheet in your possession. Yeah. I do not. Can you send me a um, yeah, overview? It's, email. it's part of an email, but I'll send them out to you again. Uh -huh. right. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you repeat that? Yeah. Like I said, I emailed blank pitch sheets out. Okay. Let me admit, Dave. Yeah. 
And I just said, I don't have that. May you resend it to me? No problem. Yep, I'll get it to you. Thank you. Right. right. Remember, this was the version of my PSA script, okay, that I marked up. Little blank storyboards. You have, you have a blank storyboard, Nolan? You have the blank floor plan? Uh, let me see. I can't see the screen. No, I don't have that. So we're supposed to do all of this, this drumming and all of that? Yeah. Yeah. All right, this is getting out of hand. <laughs> What's out of hand? <laughs> this is your final project. Firstly, firstly, I don't recall doing this last time. All this drawing. So <laughs> that's that threw me off. One. <laughs> Two storyboarding for a commercial i mean for a promo that's like 30 seconds long to a minute oh, no then yeah i'll go over the whole syllabus with you again okay and the whole public service announcement you don't have to be an artist or anything basically i just want you to do like a, a very rough storyboard a rough floor plan and your script okay i'm gonna stop sharing one second here because i know dave has entered the room here okay let me see. There's my man, Mr. Dave Feldman. How are you? I am well. How are you guys doing? Excellent. Thank you so hey. much for joining. Hello, everybody. Can't see anybody's faces. Where's everybody hiding? Yeah, everybody's hiding. Just a couple here and there. Anyway, uh, Dave is a lighting designer and lighting director extraordinaire who has worked in film and television, not film and theater. Uh, for many, many years. Let me also see if we can. I'd love to be able to record this here. Let's see. Okay. Everybody else is muted here. Okay. Dave, so welcome again. Good afternoon. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I want you to know I did some homework on you. I, you know, I did watch that you just were a couple of days ago doing a presentation for part of a, a YouTube or Zoom meeting with Community College up in Rhode Island. Yes, that was great. Me and uh, Ted and I did an interview with Kevin Olson, who's a professor and, and a director I work with uh, over the years. Uh, we did a YouTube special that's floating around. It's pretty funny to get the reactions from it. Very cool. I saw, I did watch it and uh, it was very interesting, yeah. But that was basically a, for a class that was an intro to theater. Here is right. your, we are a class in digital studio production. Okay. Okay. So students are learning all about studio operations, control room operations, and you know what goes into putting together, you know, a television production that we do. Um, we've talked about you know various uh, things you know in the past, like of course cameras and lenses. Depth of field, we've had uh, mm -hmm. issues on, not issues, uh, lectures on switching cameras and all the elements, of course, whether it's uh, playback, uh, graphics, and many other things that go into it. Um, what we're just getting into, and we just went over a homework assignment about lighting. Um, right. We're talking about fixtures. Uh, talking about contrast, tungsten, color temperature, things like that. Um, tell us, how'd you get into, you know, lighting? Give us some of your background. Uh, I got into theater lighting in high school. Uh, I went to kind of a rough school and uh, I, lived, I grew up in New York. And, and rather than uh, sitting outside all day, a professor at the school found a group of us and said, hey, uh, we won't write you up send you to the principal's office to become help us in the theater. So a group of us all went into the theater figuring out it's nicer in the theater than it is sitting outside. Mm -hmm. And out of the dozen of us, there are five of us who are professionals in the business for 30 plus years. So I had a great influence from uh, a teacher in high school. Mm -hmm. I went on to college and studied um, theater production and I had a dual major, educational psychology, theater production. Always knew I wanted to be involved in entertainment one way or the other. Um, I left school, took six months off, did an externship, worked in a bunch of theaters around New York City, 
came back to school, finished, got hired by that theater right out of college, which was a blessing. Um, I worked in modern dance and avant-garde theater and music for about 15 years, touring around the world, uh, a lot of in the East Coast, um, spent some time in Asia and Europe doing that sort of thing. I got married, had a child, needed to make some money. Uh, one of my clients went on to the David Letterman show and uh, he was a juggler and illusionist. So they asked me to come in and light it because it's a little more complicated. I went to NBC studios when Letterman was there. I lit the show and the executive producer saw my work, uh, was very impressed, asked me how long I'd be in television. I told him, well, for the last hour and a half. <laughs> and uh, that was it. And he said, uh, did I ever think I wanted a career in television? And I said, matter of fact. <laughs> and so I started at NBC and uh, I started lighting shows like the Today Show, Dateline, NFL on NBC, uh, Tom Brokaw. I did the whole OJ trials. Um, and then from there branched out, left NBC, went to CBS a little bit. I did some game shows and some soaps and then basically started my own company in between then uh, in between leaving NBC and CBS I started my own firm wanted to do my own thing MTV was a was really booming back then we were having a lot of fun doing rock videos and rock concerts and I was a little bored with the uh, the uh, network world and wanted to do go back sort of in a weird sense to where I had been in the modern dance, ballet, avant-garde, theater and music world. So I uh, started getting my own clients and continued lighting and touring and found a few little niches. I found a niche back in the news world, but this time building studios. Right. Um, and I also found a couple of other niches in sports and, and rock and roll. So with my experience of, of theater background, um, it was, easier for me to go look at a rock show and say oh yeah I see what you're doing with color direction intensities but for television we need to do this that and the other thing because we're talking about an electronic eye not a human eye exactly so exactly. I was able to uh, get a bunch of work relighting rock concerts for television um, and then the same thing for sports uh, some of the sports shows were, were looking for better and higher quality lighting. So I was doing, uh, I am the NBA all-star lighting designer. I'm just going to bring that up, yeah. I just came back from Orlando this summer. I, I put the systems in for the bubble in Orlando. Um, I've also done a bunch of MMA fighting, fight lighting. Um, I did the Pan American Games in Mexico where I lit all the arenas and all the stadiums, everything from swimming to weightlifting to soccer. Wow. Um, so each and every one of these elements adds to another. I've done soap operas. I've done, you know, running gun stuff where you're in the street with three lights and you've got to make something happen, you know, and I've done thousand unit shows. So um, there's, a, there's a huge diversity. At the end of the day, it all comes down to one thing. How good does the picture look? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we talk about many things and you brought up a great point, which is the human eye versus the electronic eye. Uh, and I think that's, you just said it all really, being the big difference between theater and television. Uh, because oh, yeah. when you're doing theater, you have a whole experience in front of you. You've got a wide stage, very deep, and nothing is hidden. It's all right there in front of the viewer. And we're watching it with a human eye. But when we transpose that to television, the electronic eye, we talk about, of course, you know, what's in the frame or what's out of the frame. And we get to control exactly what we want the viewer to see. So especially now, as we relate to, and you tell the biggest difference, you know, with uh, lighting for television, um, you know, what are the biggest transitions that, you know, we make and what, um, Basically, of course, you know, we've talked about and what it comes down to me also and what I talk to the students about, um, two things, exposure and color temperature. And video has to work so closely with lighting to be able to get that consistency through multiple cameras across to the viewer. Um, 
We have to work on those flesh tones, make everybody look good, making nice images. Of course, you know, basically television and film, those are close up mediums. Uh, we can establish a scene, we will make the setting, we'll let people see exactly where we are, but then it all comes down to medium shots, close ups, cutaways, reaction shots, all things like this. So when you're lighting for television now, uh, how do you work with you know, the different uh, sets and things you know, to make those nice images and the consistency that we need for television? So the biggest difference you know, over the last few years is the quality of cameras, lenses, and chips. Um, back when I started, there was the end of the tube camera where we needed a much, much higher intensity of light. Um, you know, having a 2000 watt light bulb in a fixture was not unusual at all. Now with the higher quality lenses, digital lenses, digital cameras, iPhones, um, the quality and the sensitivity is so amazing that, you know, I shoot some shows at 16 foot candles, 15 foot candles, which is, you know, a 10 watt bowl um, and can still, and still get definition and color and, and angle. Um, Sort of, you know, the, the, the basic is always, the, everything starts back from the old days with three-point lighting, a key, a fill, and a back. Right. Everything starts from that element, and then you build from there, depending upon how many cameras you have. If you have a single camera, then you don't have to go that much further in terms of your talent in three-point lighting, because the camera is just going to look from one direction. Naturally, you have to light the backgrounds, balance the backgrounds. Uh, work with depth, work with color temperature, uh, play with shadows. You know, shadows are not a bad thing. We're all taught and, you know, we go into the news world, especially, you know, shadows are terrible. Oh, no shadow on the neck, no shadow on the eye, no shadow on the nose. Yeah, yeah. And you could spend hours chasing and flattening shadows. Nowadays, people are a little bit more forgiving, uh, especially now with everybody being in their home studios. Um, <laughs> So that's, you know, everybody's uh, taking uh, a, a little bit of liberty with lighting on that. But when we come to, you know, when we work in a studio, um, I have a tendency, if I could call it a style of anything, is to have a harder backlight. I like a sharp edge on the shoulders, on the back of the head. I like separation. Um, with a brighter backlight, um, I can define my backgrounds a little bit better. Um, I do like a slight shadow. I was not a big proponent when uh, fluorescent lighting came out and everything was flat. Yeah. The whole idea of fluorescent flat lighting was no shadows, but it's just not natural. I mean, we, we live in a world where there's shadows. Yeah. So well, I try and embrace them. In the video world, it used to be funny. We'd walk into a studio, you flip on the lights and the fluorescents come on and everybody just looked at it and goes, okay, we're lit. <laughs> but that's not you know, quite the art of lighting. We no. And it definitely is an art form. It's, it's, you know, I always call it painting with light because, you know, oh. each, each lighting fixture is, is a stroke of a brush with a particular color and an intensity and the amount of paint or, or, or acrylics that you use. Um, so when you get to, you know, lighting plays or lighting rock and roll or lighting, you know, um, architecture, that's gonna be shot for television. You need to think in, in strokes. You need to think in direction. You need to think in palettes. Right. Mm, okay. um, yeah. No, that's great. Let me take a look at, um, you know, when we talk about, of course, your advanced techniques and everything and the fixtures, just the way television, we've moved from the analog world to the digital world to HD, uh, the sensitivity of the cameras, the resolution and everything. What have been some of the biggest uh, technological advances in lighting? So from a lighting perspective, the, the biggest technological advance overall um, is the LED. Right. Um, the invention of the LED has not only created, you know, options for us designers, but it's also, you know, completely reduced the carbon footprint. Right. Um, I used to have to use thousands and thousands of amps of power and now I can do it in hundreds. Right. And also oh, you know, as far as color temperature, we were talking about gels mm -hmm. uh, and tungsten lighting and coming into a studio and everything had this warm 
atmospheric glow to it, you know, uh, but being able to match cameras now, um, you know, and especially when it comes to the color temperature and lighting faces, uh, and just matching one shot to the other, uh, we rely so heavily on the lighting people uh, that come in because now, of course, like you said, with LED technology, you can really paint the lighting. And if there's too much green or too much blue or something, really help out the video engineers uh, balance their cameras. And that's usually the first call that, it, that an engineer is going to make is the lighting saying, okay, on the left side, we need to bring this down or bring this up. Can you warm this up? Can you make it a little cooler? And use those terms, you know, to really help them match their shots. Um, because we, you know, even when we talk about white balancing and black balancing our cameras, you know, the most important thing, of course, is making those flesh tones look really good. Um, you know, from Correct. And, and, and you can only go so far with white balance and black balance. That's really an electronic adjustment of the camera. Right. And if one camera is, you know, one year old and the other camera is three years old, when we white balance, we black balance, there's going to be a slight difference sure. just because of the age. So it does come to the lighting designer, lighting director to, you know, assist the video engineer. So that's a new trend because it used to be flipped. The video engineer used to be helping the lighting designer. Now the lighting designer is, is assisting the video engineer, which is an interesting switch in roles. Not that, not that any one is more important than the other. Um, it is a ballet between the two of them always. Definitely. And it is, you know, your lighting, your video engineer as lighting designer can be your best friend or your worst nightmare and <laughs> vice versa um, with your, your lighting director. When, you know, now with, with digital cameras, and especially now that we use so much video for scenery and backgrounds, and we know that video runs at a much cooler and a higher color temperature. So trying to light people on a large stage with a video wall um, at 3200 Kelvin, which was that warmer, natural, you know, uh, high noon kind of sunlight is a lot more difficult because then graphics and video have to really um, adjust their video walls to an unnatural level for video. So more and more today, we're lighting people at 4,000 Kelvin and in between 4,000 and 5,000 Kelvin is not unusual. So when you go to a show and you see it live, um, people don't have that warm, you know, glowy look live as much anymore. This is for shows that are being videoed, obviously videoed for, for playback. Um, but it does allow the distance between what the, the video wall and the camera have to work. So if you don't have to make your electronics work so hard um, and you can fall into those natural realms of where the camera likes to live and where video walls and television monitors like to live in terms of color temperature, well, then you're right in the middle and you're at the sweet spot using the right lighting fixtures at the right color temperature, you can then tweak things much um, in a smaller degree to get bigger outcomes. Also, I mean, in video, we talk about, you know, um, our focal length and our field of view. Uh, when you work with lighting, you're also focusing lights. Does that come down to your lensing? Does lensing really correlate to sort of a, a field of the, the light, the, the edges of the light and how you're pinpointing what you want to really highlight? There's two questions there. Lensing has less to do with the quality of the picture. Lensing has more to do with getting the light to the source. So if my lighting position um, in a studio is you know, 30, 40 feet away, I wanna make sure I have a narrower beam. Okay. Um, the quality of light should be the same, whether it's a 50 degree or a 19 degree fixture or if it's a wide zoom or a narrow zoom lens. Um, again, with LEDs and electronic and moving lights, we now have the option to have a fixture that has multiple lensing in it. Um, so at one moment, it could be a pin spot. The next minute, it can flood the whole set. The whole set. I understand. Um, I remember, you know, especially when HD first came in and we were starting with talk shows uh, and especially now we have aging talent, you know, actors and actresses coming on sets, whether it was the you old know, Letterman or Colbert or someone. Uh, HD was not kind to many of these aging actors and actresses. 
they would come in, you kept them on a wide shot, they sit down, you establish them, host asks the first question, they cut to that close up and they're like, whoa, it's like right. way too much detail, right? Right, away. definition and detail. Yeah. So if, if you studied film at all, you learned a little bit about what they used to do back in the old days is putting a stocking in, the, in front of the lens, or behind the lens. You know, and then there was all the talk of what was the best stocking to put in there to soften the entire image. So we can do that now electronically in the camera. We can we can take the detail and the definition down. Yes. Um, but another way to go around that is to make sure that there's enough light. Um, certainly more light blows out some of the wrinkles, some of the scarring and, and things like that uh, for talent. But so thing, yeah, you know, started with the lighting from below. Right. Like, so, hmm, talent, yeah. Right. Bounce lighting and, and making sure that um, there's lighting from all the proper angles. I mean, in, in television, we like to get as close to the lens as possible. But if we have three cameras or six cameras or whatever the number of cameras, um, it's hard to always have a key light from that position, especially working with a jib. So bringing either, you know, low lights, underneath lights, or having a bounce, which is a piece of white foam or a piece of warm toned foam out of the shot, <clears throat> out of the shot, but in front of the talent that bounces light up into their face. And often you can achieve that um, by taking advantage of your backlight. So your backlight can bounce right back in. You don't need a second light if you're short on fixtures. Got it. But like I said, you know, in many news desks, sometimes the light coming from the desk itself, they built it in, has been yeah. so bright, it's really blowing things out for people. You see it on that's, the paper. That's the fault of the lighting director, because we built those lights in there to save us lighting directors' butts. Right. I mean, we, we put those, and I, I was, I think I was on the one of the very first desks that did it, it was at NBC for Katie Couric, and, and we put a bunch of lights in the desk. And the first look at it was looked like it was Halloween. Mm -hmm. So those lights have to be constantly adjusted by the lighting director. The other person, you know, we haven't spoken much about in terms of the trio is the makeup artist. So the makeup artist is as important as lighting director, probably more, and they have more pull. Um, it's always best when you walk into a studio to befriend the lighting, the, the makeup artist. Makeup mm -hmm. artist has the talent's ear. They are in front of the talent. They are with the talent. They've yeah. probably with, been with the talent for a really long time. Yeah. If you piss off the makeup artist, your day is going to be miserable. This is true. And I remember being in studios when you're working with a celebrity and they come in with their own stylist, their own makeup artist. And I remember saying, okay, are we ready to go? And the, the celebrity says, I will go when they say I'm ready to go. Right. And they are talking about their own stylist and their own makeup artist. Absolutely. And, and you they will want check the lighting, either. they will check the shots, they will check everything. And it's their brand. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, light, and you know, makeup artists can have really help you out a lot because they are literally in the face of that talent. Yeah. So if you meet the makeup artist and you're not sure, you know, you've heard of this celebrity or you're not that familiar with them, and you can talk to the makeup artist and say, hey, okay, what am I in for? You know, what, oh, okay, well, here's the, here's the deal. So the left eye droops more than the right eye. And, you know, we've got a scar on the side of the face. So we try and key from the left. And, you know, I'm going to make them a little bit darker, but you should make, you know. So you can really get a lot of information to make your work look better just by having some conversations with the stylist or the makeup artist. Oh, that is good to know. That's really interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, these days now also, well, let me get into this first. Uh, not only color temperature that we talked about, but exposure. A huge part of, you know, the television production, video production is being able to properly set our exposure for all cameras. Um, we do have, of course, engineers in the control room. We can remotely control, uh, you know, through RCPs, our cameras and our irises. But if we want to keep something set, Again, it's that communication that goes on between the control room and the lighting department saying, okay, you know, can we bring so-and-so's light down a bit? Can we raise this up a bit? Because if certain director or so wants to be able to shoot it like F8 and we're not gonna open it up anymore, we're not gonna close it down. They want it to be at F8 for the proper depth of field, for the proper look that they want. We have to be able to work with, you know, lighting. 
uh, who's going to go to their dimmer board or whatever and really bring it down for us and, and help us even out the consistency of all the shots between the three or four or five cameras that we have. Sure. I mean, that's, you do get directors that like to work that way. I, I'd say that's a 50, 50 these days. Um, a lot of the time that the, the amount of light and the iris and the, uh, um, uh, speeds and all that is determined by the lighting director. And, and we can do that by just um, looking at the shot and talking about what the feel of it is. You know, do we want the background to fade away? Do we want the background to pop? Do we have a video wall? Do we do in a rock show where there's going to be huge amounts of changing elements in the background? Right. Are we doing a fashion show? Um, you know, uh, have you talked about light meters at all? No. But if you want to, uh, no, no, I always have a light meter, at least one light meter in my briefcase. So a light meter is what will save your butt and what will tell you everything you need to know about color temperature. This is a particular light meter. It's electronic. It's a light meter. Um, it's also a color meter. So it will tell me my exact color temperature. So if I walk to one set, if I'm doing multiple sets, let's talk about color temperature. We're talking about if I'm doing one set in one room and another set in another room, which does happen in, in, in multi-camera shoots, I want to make sure that the color temperature is right. So when the camera is moved from one room to the other, video engineer isn't chasing his tail or her tail. Um, so you'll go in and you'll measure it. And you'll say, OK, I'm, I want this to be at 3,800 Kelvin. I'm right at 37.5 over here. So when I go in the other room, I know what I'm shooting for. I'm not going to go up to something like 5,000 Kelvin and expect it to look the same. Same thing goes with foot candles. So when I do a show, I try and, especially nowadays because of the sensitivity, I try and keep the foot candles as low as possible um, within range of being able to find that sweet spot I talked about earlier in the cameras. The reason that we want to do that is a multi multiple thing, multiple reasons. One, the talent. You know, no longer does your talent have to sit under glaring hot lights right. for hours and hours. And, and if you make your talent comfortable, well, then you might get a callback for another job with this talent. Another reason is to allow scenery to be easily lit. So if we put a thousand foot candles on a face, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to need almost 1,500 foot candles at a set that's another, you know, eight feet or 10 feet behind the person. So it's, it's a matter of electricity, power if you don't have it, you don't have enough fixtures, but also you can, you know, with lower intensities, lower foot candles, you can paint pictures better. So if I bring in just a touch of blue, I don't have to bring in that blue at, you know, 95% or, you know, 500 foot candles. I can bring that touch of blue in you know, it may be 25 foot candles or 30 foot candles. And then when I change that intensity from 30 foot candles to 40 foot candles, it's very obvious, right? It's not, I, have to, I don't have to go from 50 foot candles to 200 foot candles to see a change. Hmm. Interesting, okay. Hey, can I ask, ask a question? Sure, we go, Edward. Um, I think you're the only one here, right? <laughs> no, I'm the only one on camera, everybody else is hiding. <laughs> Um, say, say you're shooting outdoors and you have your light meter and you take the color temperature of your subject and you think it's okay, but you're shooting next to a body of water mm. and you take the body of, of water and you have light reflect, reflecting off the water. Now, and you realize you have additional light. Do you stop down your f-stops to accommodate that additional light? So that's that's three different questions in there, the way I mm. see it, right? So you're shooting outdoors one. Right. So the first thing you want to do is measure the light you have outdoors before you even think about lighting the talent. Because if your outdoor light is at 6,500 Kelvin, we want to make sure that we're putting probably 6,000 Kelvin on the face, it's slightly warmer, just to make them look a little healthier, right? So the camera thinks, oh, this is a little bit warmer and the background's a little cooler. Now we've given that smaller range that the camera has to work. 
I'm looking at the, you know your background image right here, right? So you're sitting with uh, what bridge is that? San Francisco, San Francisco but I'm in New York. Gate, right? <laughs> so I'm looking at California sunlight, sunrise, right? And I'm seeing a glisten off the water. Well, you want to take advantage of that, right? So I want to make sure that that doesn't blow out. So again, even before I start lighting my talent, I have a look through the camera. And I look at the background, I look at the bridge, I look at the rocks, I look at the grass, I look at the sunset. Is that all okay? Right? Is that all in balance for what I'm doing? And now I'll start bringing light onto the face to just enough so it's not completely annoying, but enough to make the picture. So I don't even think about numbers in terms of, you know, f-stop. I, I, I really don't. I, I, I do that only when I'm with a film director who's doing television for the first or second time, typically. <laughs> but, you know, when we do, like I used to light the, the U.S. tennis, so the, the U.S. O, the Open, tennis open in, in, um, in Queens. And I would have no choice but to put, you know, a thousand watt fixture six feet from the talent and blast it on them. So there was something like 4,000 foot candles in their face because the court behind them was so bright, so bright because of daylight. Right. And because, because, you know, the tennis courts are that uh, greenish color. Right. Luckily now they're greenish, they used to be concrete color. Right. Um, but it, you have to work from one direction. Now, if you decide that, you know, you want to make the background go away, then you need to increase your foot candles on the face so that now you're irising down to the face levels. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's, that's pretty much where I was going. Yeah. It's, 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 you, have to, you, you can't just throw all the lights up at once, you know, and expect to make a picture. You have to let, it's like making a cake. You got to add the ingredients step by step, level by level. And that's also, you know, when you notice crews that go out and they're shooting ENG or EFP, they always have to be conscious of what's in the background. Is it going to be too bright shooting in this direction? Sometimes we might have to because if they have limited resources as to what we can put in front of our subject and bring that face level up to match a background, we might have to alter the direction of it. Uh, if there's light reflecting in from a side that they might not want or giving or blowing us out on one side, well, that's my, maybe where flags come in and we might have to cut that light off or that right. reflection off to, you know, so we don't blow out the side of a person's face and we can't move the building. So we might as well just flag it off and, uh, you know, be One able of the to most challenging out. jobs that you'll get a lot, uh, especially as you start out, is shooting in office spaces. Yeah. You, know, you go up to an executive's office and you can do an interview and naturally, you know, the office, the, the, the person who sits there all day wants a window behind them or wants a window to the side of them. And you go in there and you got to find out what time of day. And there, there are all sorts of great apps now and, and tools to help you plan even ahead of time. Sometimes when I go to a, a stadium or to a building, um, there's a couple of apps that will show you exactly where the sun is if you mm -hmm. can put the address in. So you can find out the direction of the sun, where the sun's going to be. So if you really have to worry about it. So sometimes if I go to a stadium and I know I'm doing, you know, a, a 10 a.m. shoot and I know that morning sun is coming right into that end of the field. Well, now I know I have to bring flags and scripts and all sorts of background protection. Whereas if I look at it and I go, oh, it's going to be in the opposite end of the field. Then I can bring in a much smaller, much smaller package. That's like you've seen also if you're ever in an arena um, and there are commentators up in the press booth and they're being shot, you know, and looking down on a floor, whether it's a basketball court or especially a hockey rink, something that's very bright behind them. You look up at the press booth and the lights are just glaring, you know, they're very bright because they have to balance out what's in the background. So they blast them with light from in front, they can stop everything down and then, you know, they have a nice image and everything. Now you can see, you know, what's in the background and what's going to be in the foreground. Um, Lastly, also talk about some of the advances now in the modern day technology with the remote aspects of it. Because now, of course, so much stuff is being done, remote control cameras, you can, you can light a show probably from home, your home studio. Uh, you don't even have to be on the set. I'm in the middle of that. That's what I was all morning. I'm, I'm designing three new studios. I just finished two others. Uh -huh. uh, we're doing a lot of remote studios. And they're all going to be dial in over the internet. So 
I set up all the lights. So there's one down in Florida I'm doing, one in the Hamptons. I live in New Jersey. I've mm -hmm. got one in the Hamptons, one in, the, in Florida. I'm going to have one in West Orange, and I'm going to have another one in Long Beach Island. I'm going to have four studios. They will all have uh, a computer there that will mimic a lighting board that I can bring back to one of my associates, my, my lighting board operators, who will sit in their office and have a, a Zoom camera where they can see what's going on on the set and they will um, control the lights. I have another show that I'm shooting weekly now. I don't know if you know, her, her name is Samantha B. She's a, a Comedy Central Jon Stewart disciple. And I just put a studio in for her in Connecticut. And the first few days I was up there, we focused all the lights and we queued it. And, you know, we're very concerned about COVID-19, so we're keeping a minimal amount of people. So now we've set it up so that in my office where I'm sitting right now, um, over video, I get five cameras brought to my monitor here. And there's a new app that we found that's amazing called Unity Intercom or UnityCom. And we've got 20 people on my iPad on a headset system. And we can talk to everybody or individually at any time by pushing a button. And I sit here in my office and I call light cues and I have a board operator in the studio and I speak with her and I tell her, okay, let's go to this queue, let's go to that queue, bring this channel up, bring that channel up, and uh, I can do it with my slippers on. Wow. It's pretty amazing. It is absolutely amazing. Same thing with cameras. So the director right. is in Brooklyn and he's controlling all the cameras robotically. He's in Brooklyn. I'm in, I'm in New Jersey. The video engineer is in New York. He's in a small little studio in New York. We've got an audio engineer, I believe, that's also in New York. And we've got three or four producers scattered around the country. One's in Washington, one's in Connecticut, and one's in New York. Huh. I mean, it used to be, I remember, a big deal in the studios because I was in post-production when we'd have an edit session going on in New York and the clients could be in L.A. And that was like such a big deal. Right. You, know, you don't have to be in the same place. But now it's as easy as just clicking on a Zoom meeting and, okay, here, do you, you like this? Do you like that? How we control things. The um, problem is, though, is quality control. And yeah. and I'm, I've been screaming this for years, is that I think quality control for lighting and video has gone downhill yeah. in the last 10 years because people are willing to accept iPhone videos. Well, that was quality. just what to say. Yeah, exactly. Right. This is now broadcast quality. Yeah. Right. And, and the, the quality of the video that I get sent to me from Connecticut is nowhere near the level of quality that I typically demand when I'm in a studio. So it is frustrating. I, I'm not sure yet how to figure out what, you know, because I look at something and on my monitor, you know, sure, I might have a, you know, a nice iMac monitor with a 5K blah, 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 highest end, but it still looks blown out to me when I talk to the video engineer who's sitting with a real monitor in front of a direct feed from the cameras. He's saying, no, it looks fine, dude. So I'm not sure I'm down with all this yet. Um, plus, I, you know, the whole idea about being in a, the camaraderie and the teamwork of being in the same room together, there's nothing like that kind of collaboration because I can't come up with an idea and bounce it off somebody sitting next to me when I'm, you know, 1,500 miles away. Uh, very, very true because I was just... I mean, it's a sign of the times that we need this separation now to be safe. Um, I saw a thing done on, it was one of the political conventions that was done. It was being directed by a very famous live director by the name of Glenn Weiss. Uh, he does all the big award shows, the Academy Awards, he'll do the Super Bowl, he'll do the Emmys, all these things. But literally he was doing it from his home office. Yep. Uh, they set him up with all these feeds coming in cameras everywhere and he was calling the shots and it was being switched but he was literally by himself in his home office just the way pretty much you or I are sitting in our homes or apartments calling all this and that was a really sad thing to me because anybody who's worked in studio production live production uh there is an energy in that control room um the immediacy of things the live just the live aspect of it you have an audience out there um, and you, because to be sitting next to your technical director, your playback people, your graphics people, your teleprompter, everybody having them on comm, uh, it was sad that, you know, you don't have that aspect now of just 
the buzz, the buzz in the control room, the buzz in the studio, um, and the immediacy of everything that's right there. Um, it also takes a toll on the jobs, you know, that are out there. Uh, camera operators, yeah, they're being replaced by robotics. Uh, a director can sit at home, a lighting director, everybody can sit at home. He can be adjusting things and we don't have the people running up and down the ladders um, and making all the adjustments and the grips and the PAs and the audio ones, audio twos, um, floor managers. It, we're all sitting in front of a screen with a little green light in front of us and that's production. And like I said, right now, this is what qualifies as, you know, broadcast quality. Uh, it used to be, you know, we make contracts, you know, for, to do jobs for clients and we promised them a broadcast quality product. Okay, that was defined by certain standards uh, in the industry. Now, anybody, of course, with a cell phone goes out, shoots something, and immediately it can be uploaded and it's on the six o'clock news. Um, but yeah, it's taken its job, it's taken its toll on the available jobs that are out there in the industry itself. Um, so what do you think a good place for students to start is? You know, uh, what, what sort of background? I, I stress to people that they need a good overall background with knowing the operations of everything, knowing what a control room, what goes on in the control room, what goes on in the studio. But any one of these jobs that we do, you can make a whole career out of it. Um, so what do you think is it, what do you think is a good place to start, Dave? It's tough. I mean, I'm, I mentor a few students now and, and it's really being, it's really hard being encouraging of what's in the future. We all know that we need to be safe with COVID-19 and not be around people and, and stay separate. And someday we'll all come out of this and, and go back to something. Um, I don't think it's going to be the same. I think, um, the unions are getting a little bit beat up here. I think a lot of things that we fought for over the years in terms of safety and quality and numbers of laborers is going to be reduced because we're showing that we can do things with less people now. Right. Um, but I think if I was if I was teaching a class full time again, like I had been, telling my students when they left to do the same things I used to say, right? Call up people who are in the industry, go to a shop, work in a shop for six months, learn about equipment learn about computer automated drafting, right? CAD drafting. Um, I tell performers this all the time, especially performers, because drafting is the least um, abusive to your body and can be done any time of the day. Um, you, can, you can draft at four in the morning. I don't care when you draft, as long as the finished product is on my desk at 9 a.m. It's as simple as that. And over the years, I've had ballet dancers as drafts people. I've had actors, I've had clowns i've had rock stars you know who can do it on the bus who can do it and make 24 to you know between 25 and 50 dollars an hour mm -hmm. um the other thing is just just do it i mean the the positive thing about you know our iphones being cameras is you can go out and shoot something right now if you want to you can do a setup in your in your in your bedroom in your bathroom with you know a couple of inexpensive led lights that you can buy off the web and, you know, practice and play and become better and better and try things. What does work? What doesn't work? Why doesn't it work? Does it really not work? Or is it just not the norm? You know, should I break a few rules here and, and make this the norm? Um, education, you know, the, the college education and having the ability to use the equipment that's available in colleges, there's nothing that beats that because rarely are you going to get the amount of equipment and the amount of time and the amount of space to practice, play, and make mistakes outside of college or education. Uh, that's what education's about. It's about trying things, pushing the boundaries, making the mistakes. I mean, if you're not making mistakes, yeah. you're not trying hard enough. Absolutely. And if you're not making mistakes, you're not learning anything new to teach me, the old guy. Because we <laughs> expect you guys who are younger and in the business coming up to break some rules and make some new things, come up with a new lighting fixture, come up with a new lens for a camera, come up with a new technique that we can learn from after we give you what we've learned. True. I mean, you talk about all the things we've uh, talked about in the class, making mistakes. Absolutely. You learn from, yeah, your failures. You know, we've said, I, I bring up a lot of quotes, like I said, from uh, famous directors. It all comes down to what's in the frame or what's out of the frame. Um, 
you know, we learn only from our, yeah, from trying it again and from the failures that we have. Um, it's, uh, you got to go out there and do it. Go out there and shoot. I bet you, you know, take your cameras. If you see something in the street, pull out the camera, take a shot of it, look at your creative eye, try something new. Um, you know, send it in, send it to me. Uh, because we're doing this all virtually, then their final project is to do a, a public service announcement. Normally we do this in the studio, uh, utilizing all the resources that we have, the mm -hmm. cameras, playback, teleprompter, music, whatever else. Um, because we're doing it virtually now, um, the sky's the limit. You know, if you want to envision a camera swooping in, someone doing a walk and talk, going through a window, you know, shooting through a window, I should say, you know, and into an in from an exterior into an interior, go do it. Yeah. You know, time it out, the planning, it's all in the details. Uh, yeah, play with, you know, thing. I used to, I used to give assignments to my students to, you have to light this scene and it's a person walking, walking to a desk, sitting down and giving a PSA and you can't use any lights. <laughs> Figure it out. So a lot of people would do it outside with a piece of cardboard and a piece of tinfoil. Okay. And you bounce the sun. Yeah. Into, you set up your backgrounds, right? You get your background looking nice, and then you bounce the sun into the face. Yeah. Um, there are lots of options to do it. I think, I think the, the, the most interesting thing for me was when I was in school and, you, and you're working with all this incredible equipment, and then all of a sudden you get out, and you've got equipment that's 10 to 15 years older than the stuff that you had in college. How do you make that work better? And, and the other most important thing that I like to say, and as I, I need to wrap this up is, sure. um, use your eyes. I mean, your eyes are the best lens, the best camera, and, and, and use your brain, right? Even when you're not shooting or thinking about shooting, you're sitting on a, on a porch somewhere watching the sunset, watch that sunset, record that into your memory banks, download that information so the next time you're in a situation where you have to create a sunset, you can refer back to that imagery, right? Look at the shadows when they come through the trees. The light right now is gorgeous as we head into fall, right? It's coming through all the colors of the leaves. Record those images into your brain so you have a place to go back to. Actors do that with emotions called sense memory, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we can do the same thing as designers is recording nature and how to bring that back into the studio or into the theater. And, and there is no better light. Right? There is no better lighting than nature. So if we can get close to what we see, then we're doing a good job that day. Any okay. questions before I have to jump from anybody? Yeah, anybody? I have one. Yeah, okay, Edward, go. I've got a crazy scene in my head, and I don't know how to shoot. I, well, basically, I, uh -huh. I'd like to shoot a, uh, a ghost, uh -huh. and, but I want to use an actor. And the, the room has to be pitch black, and the actor has to walk across the room towards the camera in a white robe. What kind of light do I hit that actor with to completely block out any other shadows that might come up? Come up? So I would first play with a very large flat panel LED, the biggest one I can get my hands on. Okay. Right, because that's the softest kind of light, which um, doesn't throw very far, right? So you don't have to worry so much about the light passing, uh, passing the actor. Right. Um, the challenge you're gonna have is where are you gonna put the camera? Right. And where are you gonna put the light? And remember to keep the light at a super low level and open the lens all the way up. And then when you take it to post, you can cheat the blackness, what we call crushing the blacks, right? So take your blacks lower than zero in post. Are you able to post it? Okay. Are you, are you able to edit it in post? Yeah. So take the blacks less than zero. Yes. Yeah, really, really crush the blacks, and that'll, right. and then um, you, you're, when you're shooting it, you may see a little bit of extra light, but once you take it into post and you define the, the blacks, um, all you should see is a spooky image. I just thought I'd hear from an expert. <laughs> Send me a copy. <laughs> I will. 
<laughs> there's that flashlight under the chin. That's also a good effect, you know. Yeah, you're not going to need a whole lot of light. I'm saying right. that, you know, the advantage of a, of a flat panel is it is so soft and so diffused. Huh. You might even put a piece of diffusion over the soft panel huh. so that it's really just a, a blip of light because okay. you're not going to need it. The hardest thing you're going to have is finding a place to get that dark. Right. Right. Okay. Right. All right, guys. So there you have it. Uh, Dave, thank you okay. so much. My pleasure. Good to see you, Bruce. Good class. Thank you, Dave. I'll send you a copy when I do All it. All right, Edward. Nice chatting with you. Anybody else thank out you, there? Man. Just good luck. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. All right, we're going to uh, take a little break now until about 4, 4 5. Thank you again, Dave. My pleasure. And, uh, I'll see you guys in about 10 minutes, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.